uh, we'll see our uh, next speaker, my colleague, my friend, uh, Dr. Amr Hashim. Dr. Amr Hashim is uh, graduated from Alexander University in 1998. Uh, he got his master's degree in 2003, and he got his MD on 2010. And he became a consultant in pediatric cardiac anesthesia in Alexandria. And uh, he got his fellowship uh, in, yeah, he got his fellowship in cardiac, pediatric cardiac, uh, uh, cardiothoracic anesthesia from Freeman Hospital in England, in England, and 19, uh, 1918, 2018, 2019, he's become a fellow in pediatric cardiac ICU. Also in 2020, he became a card adult cardiothoracic anesthesia and ITU consultant in Freeman Hospital. His talk today is about the anesthetic management of cardiac patient undergoing non-cardiac surgery. Welcome, Dr. Amr. Please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mohammed, uh, my dear professor, and uh, my dear colleagues and the professors as well. Um, thank you, Dr. Walid, and uh, the, all the panelists for uh, your kind uh, invitation for me to participate. And th thanks, Professor Ibrahim, Mohammed Ibrahim for the nice introduction. So we'll speak about the anesthetic management of the cardiac patient undergoing non-cardiac surgery. I tried to include as much as I can from the uh, guidelines uh, here uh, in different uh, slides, uh, but I'm trying also to touch the bases uh, for the uh, 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 younger colleagues as well. So, um, Uh, so introduction with the magnitude of this problem. This is worldwide problem with associated an average overall uh, uh, complication of 7 to 11 percent and a mortality of 0 0.8 to 1.5 percent. And there is a 42 percent of these are caused by cardiac complications. So a big number uh, from cardiac complications. And estimated number of major operations now are increasing. So it's almost 4 percent of the world population per year or more. Uh, we'll have a case scenario uh, which we will go through uh, uh, after that. So a 75-year-old uh, presents with, uh, to the general um, ICU, to the general surgical list with, uh, 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 for abdominal permanent resection and uh, for invasive sigmoid tumor, had MI two years ago, had since a coronary artery bypass graft, and he gets angina on severe exertion, and recent coronary angiogram showed the stenosis of one of the diagonal arteries, not amenable for stenting or surgical treatment. He's hypertensive, for which he takes ACE inhibitor, and he also has atrial fibrillation with rate controlled on digoxin, and he's taking warfarin. So lots of comorbidities uh, with this patient. So outlines for this is what is your anesthetic plan? It usually includes preoperative assessment, intraoperative management, and trying to minimize the risks and outcomes and the postoperative plan. And we will discuss some references such as the European Society of Cardiology, European Society of Anesthesia Guidelines, American Heart Association, and the Canadian Guidelines uh, to include. Uh, what is the main issues of these patients? This is an old age patient, significant cardiac disease, needs a major laparotomy for cancer, he has comorbidities which increase his perioperative risk and on his own medications that need management in the perioperative period. We we'll start with the preoperative assessment. Always during the preoperative assessment, we have to look at two arms. The first arm is the surgery. What is the risk of surgery and anesthesia? Second arm is the patient and what is the preoperative condition of this patient and how to optimize this condition before surgery. Um, so uh, there is always a estimate of the certainty that we have to look at and always be uh, in front of our eyes. So usually with the class and the level of evidence. So for the class of evidence, there's always class one, class two A, class two B. Usually very simple, class one is benefit outweighs the risk. Class 2A benefit is more than the risk, more, more than the risk. And the class 2B, the benefit is more than or equal 
the risk, and the class three is always no benefit or harm. Levels of evidence according to the uh, uh, population studies uh, and the uh, randomized control studies and the uh, expert opinions are level A, B, and C. So the preoperative evaluation of this patient is always a step lateral or stepwise approach that we use. And we said that there is always one arm is the surgery, one arm is the patient. So we'll have six, first six points alternating between the surgery and the, the, the uh, patient. So urgent surgery or unstable cardiac condition, risk of surgical procedure, functional capacity of the patient, and the patient with poor functional capacity would need surgical procedure. And then consider again the cardiac risk factors. And when we finish these six points, we should go to uh, considering if there is, we need non-invasive testing or not and they manage through. So seven points, six of which, according to the European Society guidelines, six of which alternating dealing with the surgery and patient, and then the last point dealing, dealing with the uh, non-invasive testing. Um, and so we have to know that the urgent operation is, emergent operation is less than six hours urgent six to 24 hours, a time sensitive operation may delay for up to six weeks and the elective surgery uh, uh, may delay for up to one year. This is important terminologies. We go through step one. If this person has an urgent surgery or not, if yes, just go to surgery, okay? Uh, and this should be evaluated very well if we have this urgent surgery with a consultant on the consultant base to uh, 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 do the strategy for the perioperative monitoring, perioperative management, and the postoperative management, and the need for surveillance for any cardiac events, uh, 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 and to continue or discontinue on any of the drugs, especially the anticoagulation in which the patient is having. And this is always according to the risk benefit that he can see. If this patient is not an urgent surgery, we can go to step two, and. Uh, now assessing the, uh, 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 the cardiac state, this patient is have uncardiac, unstable cardiac condition, such as unstable angina, acute heart failure, significant arrhythmias, symptomatic uh, valvular disease, or recent myocardial infarction within 30 days, or residual myocardial ischemia. If this is the case, okay, therefore we will postpone and do an MDT or multidisciplinary team to discuss this patient and see the options, uh, how to manage, how to get him back to go into surgery later on. But if this is not the case, we'll go to stop step three. In step three, we usually assess the risk of the surgical procedure. Is it a low risk surgical procedure or intermediate or high risk surgical uh, procedures? Uh, and with this, if it is a low surgical procedure, just go to surgery. When you go to surgery, do you, know, do you need to do something before going to surgery? Yes, we, you can, uh, if the patient is having heart failure or systolic dysfunction, she should continue with uh, the ACE inhibitors. If the patient has a known ischemic heart disease or myocardial ischemia, tight uh, uh, initiation of a beta blocker may be attempted to be, but the 2A, which is important, is the vascular surgery. You should initiate statins uh, uh, is very important. So if the patient is intermediate or high risk, we should go to step four, okay? So for this patient, for example, uh, which we had is, lies in this category, which is the intermediate risk surgery. I have to highlight that the transversal section of prostate, for example, is a low risk surgery. Intermediate risks such as peripheral artery angiopathy or endovascular aneurysm repairs that are TVAR or EVAR, and the renal transplant is an intermediate. High risk is any open limb prevascularization, even am amputation or thromboembolectomy, uh, 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 pneumonectomy or pulmonary or liver transplant is a high risk surgery. Our patient lies in this group. So we'll then go to step four, which is the functional capacity examination. Uh, functional capacity or the METs of the patient are very important uh, 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 for this patient scheduled for intermediate or high risk surgery. If the patient, and this is according to the Duke Active Status Index that we all uh, know and calculates the MET value, and if the patient is more than four METs, which he can walk up a flight of steps or hill 
or work on level ground at three to four miles per hour uh, for 100 meters, and then this patient is 400 meters or more. 400 meters or more, just okay, good 400 meters or more, so we can go to surgery. But before going to surgery, same, same, again, if this vascular surgery in the statin, if it is uh, a heart failure, systolic dysfunction is inhibitor should be considered, and uh, level 2B, you can, uh, is about the beta blockers. This is the uh, uh, same as we do. But if this patient has moderate or poor functional capacity, which is are less than four METs, we go to step five. And with the step five, in patients with functional capacity less than four, there's always intermediate uh, uh, risk surgery and high risk surgery. So again, in high intermediate risk surgery, in, in less than four METs, in patients with one or more clinical risk factors, which we will mention now, these are the risk factors. So again, if go surgery and then patient, surgery, patient. So here is patient less than four meds, go surgery, intermediate surgery, go patient, risk factors. So patient with risk factors, ischemic heart disease, heart failure, uh, 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 stroke, or a transit ischemic attack, renal dysfunction, uh, uh, and diabetes mellitus on insulin therapy. For all of these patients, in patients with one or more of these clinical risk factors, non-invasive testing may be considered, and it's, always, it's also to be, which is more than or equal the benefit and the risk. So it is not very well validated. In patients with one or more clinical risk factors, baseline ECG is recommended. This is class A, so at least to do an ECG for this patient, okay, with any one or two or more risk factors, and then go to surgery. Uh, uh, then, uh, if this patient is in the high risk surgery patients where the number of risks is less than two or equal to two, just do a rest echocardiograph and the biomarkers for the evaluation of left ventricular function, and this is still 2B. So he can go to surgery without even doing an echocardiogram or biomarkers uh, uh, if he has two or less uh, from these risk factors. But if he has more than three or equal to three risk factors, we should go to step seven. Step seven, step seven is of the six steps that we had uh, uh, with two arms. This is step is one with one arm, only the last one, which should have a cardiac test. It, and if this cardiac stress test, stress testing is showing extensive ischemia and uh, individualized the perioperative management is recommended. Also, for each patient is individualized management. Considering the potential benefit of the surgical procedures compared with the predicted adverse outcome and the effect of medical therapy and or coronary revascularization. You can consider for revascularization or you cannot, and this depends on the individualized management. So if there is no or moderate stress induced ischemia, you can go to surgery. So with extensive ischemia here, you can do balloon angioplasty, bare metal stenting, and uh, 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 surgery uh, 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 with uh, uh, drug eluting stenting or CABG or cabbage. So with each of them, you can then follow up and uh, this patient go to surgery. And uh, uh, if you go to surgery, each will have a certain protocol after stenting or after uh, cabbage procedures. The American guidelines is uh, much simpler than the European guidelines and they differ here in this point. So the American guidelines here has only low and high risks. There is no uh, intermediate. Uh, uh, this is very important. The other point of difference here is the management which is uh, uh, according to the risk. So with the European, European, we have intermediate risk and the high risk, each with a separate management. But in the American Heart Association, there's always low risk and the high risk. And if we have high risk, we to elevated patients with low functional capacity and the high risk, this we will judge. If we do the test, we'll change the decision or not to change the decision. So even if patients, with low METs less than four, and even in patients with low METs and high risk procedure, you should always think, is the test that I'm going to do, is it going to change my decision or not? If not, just proceed to surgery. If uh, it is go going to change your decision, okay, 
impact your decision making, proceed to surgery or consideration of alternative strategies after you do the uh, testing that you need, which is the stress testing that uh, uh, we mentioned before. Uh, the uh, risk stratification from the American point depends on the risk cardiac risk index, uh, uh, reproduced risk index and the American College of Surgeons uh, 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 protocols, which combine the patient and the cardiac risk in one uh, stratification and they take decision according to them, uh, which is different from the five points that we mentioned before. So with the risk, how to, how to reduce the risks of this operation? Uh, uh, you can use drugs, for example. So from the guidelines as well here, that you can find always that beta blockers are very important. We know all the POIS study and uh, 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 that high dose beta blockers initiation before surgery is now condemned and it is prohibited and it can cause stroke uh, to the patient. So always if patient is only on beta blockers, small dose just continue with the beta blockers. If the patient, and this is class 1b, okay, and uh, uh, class 2b, three of them of class 2b, if this patient uh, we can give him beta blockers if he has two or more risk, clinical risk factors or as a status more than uh, 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 or equal three, preoperative initiation of beta blockers may be considered in patients which have ischemic heart disease. So this is initiation, this is 2B as well. And when oral beta blockers is initiated, can undergo non-cardiac surgery, uh, we can use the atenolol or bisoprolol as the first choice, this, this 2B. And co condemned is to initiate perioperative high dose beta blockers without titration. This is no, this, this is class three. The operative initiation of beta blockers is not recommended in patients scheduled for low risk surgery at all. Um, statins, yes, use statins. If the patient with statins continues statins and especially for vascular surgery and uh, 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 better to use two weeks before cardiac surgery, uh, vascular surgery. Uh, ACE inhibitors, if the patient is taking ACE inhibitors for cardiac failure, for heart failure, continue ACE inhibitors. Continue ARBs for heart failure, okay? And initiation, yes, you can initiate uh, ACE inhibitors ARBs at least one week before surgery in cardiac stable patients with heart failure and LV systolic dysfunction. If you have a patient with cardiac dysfunction uh, uh, stable, you can initiate. Uh, 2A as well, transient discontinuation of these for patients with hypertension. So still we discontinue these medications for patients going to surgery with hypertension. Only heart failure that should continue or initiate. Alpha-2 receptors such as clonidine are not advised anymore because of the risks of hypotension during surgery. Nitrates as well, have, no effect has been demonstrated on the incidence of myocardial infarction or cardiac death, so no, no role. Uh, calcium channel blockers, if, the, if it is dihydropyridine, it is not, uh, should be avoided. And if the patient is taking this, uh, uh, as an alternative for beta blockers to contain the, uh, to, 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 to control the arrhythmia, continue with them because these are for arrhythmogenic purposes. And this patient has contraindication for beta blockers. And if this patient is for vasoactive, uh, vasospastic, uh, vasospastic angina, this angina, then continue with them. Diuretics are very important. If diuretics are usually taken for hypertension or heart failure, if these are for blood pressure reduction or hypertension, uh, so just continue uh, uh, the therapy and resume the oral uh, 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 diuretic after surgery. But if the patient after surgery needs uh, a control of blood pressure, don't give IV or don't give uh, more of the usual of the diuretics. Just consider another, another drug for control of hypertension. But if this medication diuretic is for heart failure, you should always continue in the period and you can judge the dose. You can modify the dose. If the patient is, is still a little bit congested, you can increase the dose. If the patient is hypovolemic or have electrolyte disturbance, reduce the dose. And this is very important as well. Attention to diuretics and arrhythmias are very important. Hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, you should be corrected before surgery if they are significant. If they are not significant, don't correct them. Okay, and you can shift to the potassium or magnesium sparing aldosterone antagonist to reduce the risk of mortality in patients with severe heart failure. So in patients with severe heart failure, 
if they are suffering of potassium or magnesium deficiencies, they can go into fatal arrhythmias. And at, this, at that point, it's not advised to continue on these diuretics. You can shift to sparing diuretics. Acute preoperative reception of asymptomatic patient with electrolyte disturbance, don't touch, okay? Don't touch, you may cause more harm. Uh, another risk strategy are the blood thinning drugs. Uh, blood thinning drugs are very important. So aspirin, for example, uh, uh, in patients with no coronary stents. In these patients uh, with no coronary stents, these patients on aspirin for stroke, for any other reason, but for no coronary stents, there is a 2A recommendation, is the discontinuation of aspirin in patients who are liable to bleeding. If, you, if our, these patients are uh, going to have major bleeding, they are discontinued. And 2B, which is not very uh, uh, um, uh, strong, you can continue with the aspirin in patients previously treated with aspirin may be considered in the preoperative period, and this is continuing the risk of bleeding and thrombosis. This is from the European part. From the American part, in patients undergoing non-emergency, non-urgent, non-cardiac surgery, which have no coronary stent, reasonable to continue aspirin is 2B. And no benefit is to uh, uh, initiate or continue aspirin uh, in patients which have non-cardiac, non-carotic surgery, and no coronary stenting unless there is an evidence of risk of ischemic event which outweighs the risk of the surgical bleeding in these patients. Uh, this is very important. Frequent consultations you always face are the coronary stents patients and the VTA, uh, vitamin K antagonist, and uh, 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 oral, uh, new oral anticoagulants. And these are very important for the patients of elective uh, uh, timing of elective non-cardiac surgery patients with coronary stents. This is very important. If this patient has bare metal stent or drug looting stent, the patient with bare metal stent on dual or uh, dual anticoagulant or dual antiplatelet uh, therapy, uh, it is less than 30 days or three months or six months. Okay? So it's very dangerous to uh, 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 before 30 days to stop this, so this class three. After 30 days, you can proceed with surgery and stop the dual anticoagulant. And if it is the drug eluting the new generations, you have more than six months is safe to stop and proceed with surgery if it is a important surgery. Uh, you can proceed with this. If it is less than three months, between three and the six months, this is dangerous. This is class 2B still, and you have to weigh the benefit against the risk of um, stopping the dual antiplatelet therapy uh, for these patients. They, this was in the 2016 uh, 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 American. In the 2017 European, uh, they, are, they were more courageous and the more risky with these patients. So uh, if these patients uh, 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 they said they can stop the, uh, uh, it is class uh, 3B or class 2AB or class 1B. If it is between one and six months, they can stop. If this patient has acute coronary syndrome at index PCI or other high ischemic features. So if this patient had acute coronary syndrome, uh, 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 yes, this is class 2B and level of evidence C. But if this patient has, during the insertion point, we haven't had acute coronary syndrome or have, has no high risk ischemic events, so 2A with a level of evidence B, you can after one month to stop. But this is very important and this patient should be aspirin coverage. So this is very risky, to be honest, between, after one month uh, to stop the dual antiplatelets from the European side. Uh, so how can we discontinue these antiplatelets? We can see here, this is very important, the patient. So the uh, clopidogrel, for example, can be stopped five days before surgery, three days for uh, ticarolol, and seven days for... Uh, and all of them should be under cover of aspirin. So under cover of aspirin, you can stop this. And before surgery, you can judge the aspirin and the need for aspirin uh, on a risk benefit uh, assessment. Um, uh, vitamin K antagonists 
So stop warfarin, we know five days before the surgery. So we always think, why is this patient taking warfarin? Is it for low risk and is taking warfarin, no bridging? If it is medium risk for thrombosis or high risk, bridging is considered for medium risk and it is recommended for uh, high risk. And you can start the low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin when the, when the INR is out of therapeutic range. So you measure daily INR. When your INR is out of the range, you start the low molecular or unfractionated heparin, and you should discontinue the low molecular weight heparin 24 hours, please 24 hours, not a 12 hour procedure, and the discontinue the unfractionated heparin infusion four to six hours before the uh, procedure. Uh, for the um, uh, uh, how to manage the um, patient uh, with the vitamin K. So this is the algorithm here. And after you stop this, you can restart the, after the operation, restart the uh, vitamin K antagonist or the warfarin at the same time, which is almost 12 to 24 hours after restarting the low molecular weight happens. Start at the same time after surgery if there is good uh, hemostasis, okay? And if there is, bleeding so restart the low molecular weight happened 48 to 72 hours after the uh, high bleeding risk surgery so here you can restart because it takes like three to uh, days to achieve the anticoagulation part you can start to 12 hours or delay to 24 hours according to the bleeding and this you can start as well 24 hours after surgery if there is good hemostasis or 48 hours to 72 hours if there is risk of bleeding so how, when to stop the low molecular weight uh, heparin when INR is within the uh, therapeutic range. At this point, you can stop the low molecular uh, weight uh, heparin. Um, so these are the steps that we have here. Uh, oral anticoagulant are very important. So most of them, if two days are efficient or sufficient for most of them, Rivaroxipan, abixipan, adoxipan, except for the dabigatrin, which depends on the glomerular filtration rate. So if this filtration rate is low, you can uh, stop at uh, uh, four days, for example. And, but if this uh, low, uh, the, uh, estimated glomerular filtration rate is high enough, you can stop it as well two days. So two days is the uh, most of the... So for the prosthetic valves, you can have for mitral valve, aortic valves with risk factors. There is always the INR is three, uh, as you see the target. And here, bridging is very important. But with aortic valve uh, replacement uh, with no risk factors, uh, uh, the uh, target is 2.5, uh, uh, and you can do no bridging here. Uh, for bioprostatic valves as well, uh, uh, 2.5 is the uh, for the mitral valve uh, is the range 2.5, not 3, uh, for the first three months, and then you shift to the uh, uh, aspirin, and then here for the aortic valve replacement as well, you can do this. For the uh, tower, you can uh, put the patient on clopidogrel 75 milligrams, uh, aspirin 75 to 100 milligrams once daily for the first six months. So uh, in continuation with the risk reduction strategies, uh, we talked previously about the revascularization. Revascularization is only in class one. We can see that myocardial revascularization is recommended according to the applicable guidelines for management of any stable coronary artery disease. What else? Late revascularization after successful non-cardiac surgery can be done, which is class one. Okay. 2B, this is the 2B. We always 2B. You have to remember that this is 2B, which is the prophylactic myocardial revascularization is class 2B. And this is a study such as the coronary artery vascularization prophylaxis studies, which showed that uh, 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 only patients with unprotected left main coronary artery benefited from preoperative revascularization. So you can pro pro proceed with these patients to surgery without prophylactic revascularization. For specific diseases, important is the chronic heart failure, and we talked about the importance of uh, the uh, ACE inhibitors that should continue on ACE inhibitors. And it is recommended that these patients are uh, 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 scheduled for non cardiac surgery undergo evaluation of the left ventricle with a transosoratic echo, okay, uh, uh, and uh, or without the uh, natural uh, uh, 
BMP, which is the brain natriuretic peptide as well, unless they have been assessed for this before. It's also recommended that patients with established heart failure who are scheduled for intermediate or high risk surgery uh, uh, therapeutically be optimized with the ACE inhibitors. Patients with newly diagnosed heart failure, they recommended that intermediate or high risk surgery be deferred preferably for at least three months. So you don't act on the patients with acute or newly diagnosed acute heart failure, you have at least three months to optimize this patient before going to surgery. And beta blocker is very important to continue and its inhibitors as uh, well. And initiation of high dose beta blocker is content. Arterial hypertension, you can proceed with, according to the guidelines, with a systolic of less than 180, diastolic less than 110, you can go with 2B, but preferably uh, a better control with the blood pressure. And fluctuations in blood pressure is not recommended. And the patients diagnosed with hypertension should be screened for end organ failure. For the valvular heart disease, the most important is the aortic stenosis. It's very important that the patient have good evalua evaluation of the echocardiographic for the patients with symptomatic aortic stenosis. And uh, aortic valve replacement is recommended in symptomatic patients uh, 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 with a severe aortic stenosis scheduled for elective cardiac, cardiac surgery. This is very, so uh, a good evaluation, aortic valve replacement of symptomatic aortic stenosis and aortic valve replacement should be considered in asymptomatic if uh, severe aortic stenosis are scheduled for elective high non uh, high risk non cardiac surgery. This is 2A as well. So all most of them important things are the severe aortic stenosis, either symptomatic or are non symptomatic. Uh, in symptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis who are scheduled for elective non cardiac surgery, you can consider TAVI. You can consider balloon aortic valvuloplasty for the mitral stenosis, so non-invasive measures. This is 2A before going to surgery. Elective non-cardiac surgery should be considered in patients with severe valvular regurgitation. You can go with surgery in patients with severe valvular regurgitation who have no LV dysfunction or severe heart failure. Uh, and the percutaneous mitral chromatotomy can be for the severe or moderate mitral stenosis if it is symptomatic. Um, the antibiotic prophylaxis, there is a guideline which 2015 European Society of Cardiology guidelines and it's focusing on the dental procedures and the non-dental procedures. And we have seen many of these respiratory tract procedures, gastrointestinal, urogenital procedures, uh, uh, patients who are asymptomatic having, for example, or severe, or severe aortic stenosis, which is asymptomatic or calcified annulus or calcified aortic valve. And this undergo According to the guidelines, they undergo these procedures without endocardia, endo, endocarditis prophylaxis, and they develop later effect of endocarditis. We have many patients. We see many, many patients which go by the guidelines, don't give antibiotics for these procedures, and they come because they are having uh, undiagnosed, non-symptomatic, severe uh, valvular diseases. They can come later with infective endocarditis. So this, I think, needs to be um, uh, readdressed. Uh, arrhythmia is very important. You should continue the antiarrhythmic drug until surgery. You don't uh, discontinue. Antiarrhythmic drugs are very important. If the patient has VPCs, don't give antiarrhythmic drugs. Only if he has sustained VTAC, you can give antiarrhythmic drugs. Um, um, so, uh, supraventricular arrhythmias. Uh, oral anticoagulation is very important for these patients. So, patients with AF. Okay, you have to continue with the anticoagulation and you can either bridge or no bridge according to the previous guidelines that we said. Recommendations for the bradyarrhythmias are the same for any bradyarrhythmias. Temporary pacemaker is the same as the permanent pacemaker as a guideline for initiating pacemakers. Recommended that hospital uh, nominate for, for pacemakers, which is responsible for the pacemakers. He can, uh, preoperatively, we can call him to uh, put the patient on DDO or VVO or AAO, whatever we uh, want to avoid the interference with the pacemakers. Also, the ICDs are very important. You have to uh, uh, deactivate the ICD before going to surgery, and immediately after surgery, you have to again activate the ICD and, uh, uh, again. This is very important in terms of arrhythmias. Renal disease is very important, and you have to have good monitoring of renal 
uh, function and affects the uh, vascular, the cardiac outcome, uh, and it's very important as well. Uh, for the cerebrovascular disease, antiplatelets, anticoagulation treatment should be continued whenever possible throughout the preoperative period. If this patient is dependent on this medication, has history of stroke, if it, there is no uh, risk, you can continue. Alternatively, the period of drug withdrawal should be kept as short as possible. If you have to stop them, stop them as short as possible. Peripheral artery disease, any patient with peripheral artery disease, you should screen for coronary artery ischemic heart disease. Uh, for the preoperative monitoring, we discussed the ECG. ECG is not for all patients. ECG, you have to know that there is now preoperative ECG monitoring is recommended for all patients. This is no discussion about it. Selected leads combination should be considered for better detection. So lead two and lead five, for example, uh, uh, for the ischemic uh, uh, events. When feasible, 12 lead ECG can be used for high risk patients. Uh, Transosophageal echocardiography. You can use the transfer of share should be considered in patients who develop ST segment changes on intraoperative or perioperative ECG monitoring. So any patients who has hemodynamic instability during surgery, put a TOE and see what is this patient having. If uh, uh, um, any sustained, so you, you have patient with hemodynamic instability, you give fluids, you give vasoactive or vasopressors, is not, the patient is not improving, put a TOE to see what's happening, okay? So this is uh, 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 very uh, important. And Dr. Amr, I remind you by the time. Uh, Five minutes. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Right, heart catheterization has no role uh, uh, now. The glucose is very important to uh, uh, control targeting levels less than 10 millimoles or 180 milligrams per deciliter and Anemia, very important, the, this oxygen carrying capacity, uh, uh, do transfusion in emergency surgery, optimize the patient before elective surgery, body temperature, very important as well. No, from the, from the anesthetic point, from the anesthetic point, no difference between inhalational and uh, intravenous as long as you are doing it in a better way. Neuroaxial anesthesia, as long as it is not causing a hypotension, uh, uh, you can use it alone, but in combination, it might cause hypotension and it not be harmful. Avoiding arterial hypotension during surgery is very important. And avoiding non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, especially the COX-2 inhibitors. Call directed therapy is very important, which means that you monitor the fluid response with certain uh, uh, monitors and see if this patient has good response, especially in high-risk surgeries. Hemoassist device like ECMOs, and this uh, intraortic balloon pumps, if the patient collapses, you can use it, and this is to be from the American point. Post-operative management, surveillance of these patients for MRI, obtaining ECGs for suspected myocardial infarction, uh, so obtaining troponin, and obtaining BMP for uh, follow-up of the heart condition is also recommended in some uh, uh, guidelines, especially the Canadian here. We can see that if the patient is more 65 years, uh, 1865 with significant cardiovascular, you can measure to a point in daily, 48 to 72 hours, obtain ECG impact, you consider the hospital share, and you can do the uh, PMB, uh, pro BMB uh, as well. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, listening. And I think the, 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 the most important take home for this, it is one of the most important topics. You should always uh, try to uh, pre-evaluate the pre-assessment is very important. Optimizing the patient condition is very important. And then uh, pharmacological optimization or interventional uh, as well. And then to put a very good plan for anesthesia, uh, pre-op uh, monitoring and anesthetic uh, delivery and a very important pre-operative, post-operative management uh, as well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Amr. It's a very, very nice, informative uh, lecture, really. And I know it's a full uh, and it's full. Uh, there are a lot of uh, informations you didn't mention because of the time. I know that. But I want to ask a question about uh, this routinely everyday practice. A cardiac patient doing non-cardiac surgery. I think all of us uh, met that patient and uh, are meeting every day. What about the, uh, the six minutes walk? Test now is it? It, it has any uh, role now in any guidelines? I, 
it's mentioned in some guidelines. What do you think about it? It's, it's usually about the cardiopulmonary uh, combination index, uh, and it's very yeah. important, but it's more in the thoracic, thoracic surgeries rather than the uh, uh, non-cardiac surgeries. So it's, it's the most important is the functional capacity, capacity of the MET, but the cardiopulmonary uh, uh, combination index and six minutes walks and the oxygen consumption as these things are more for the pneumonectomies and the thoracic procedures are very important for the thoracic procedures. Uh, or yeah. if there is a combination between cardiac and the pulmonary uh, disease as well. Okay. Also, another question is also, uh, what is the hemoglobin point? All of us, what is when we transfuse the cardiac patient, when I give, I give him blood, when I, I let him go to surgery? It is seven, it is nine, it is eight, it is 10, it is what? It's according to the guidelines, last slide, we said that if it is emergency surgery, you should go to surgery and you can transfuse the patient with blood. If it is an elective and you have time, you should go with the procedural correction of the uh, patient's HP, uh, we, according to the cause of the anemia, so to, according to the cause, you can treat the type of the anemia according to the cause, and uh, you can uh, 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 reach the optimum optimum level at least according to the uh, other 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 parameters of oxygen delivery. So you can weigh the evidence or the number of the HB level with the other parameters for oxygen delivery. So if this patient, for example, is having low cardiac output, he should have a good HP level to help him with the auction delivery. If this patient have uh, uh, any other issues with the auction delivery optimization of the HP, if you have time, is very important. So it is not only about numbers, uh, it's always about the whole patient condition and the type of surgery and the, and the type of the, and the oxygen delivery, optimum oxygen delivery for this patient. This is my, my, my own practice. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, any question? Anyone for Dr. Alid uh, raise his hand for any question? Uh, yes, we have two questions here. So we start by uh, Ahmed Youssef. Ahmed, go ahead, please. Ahmed Youssef, go ahead. It's not a so yeah. Whoever is ready, go ahead with your question, please. Thank, thank you, Dr. Walid. Thank you, Dr. Amr, for this valuable uh, lectures. I have two questions. Uh, if I have thrombolyzed the patient uh, uh, for uh, looks like pulmonary embolism, for how long shall I wait before we operate him for non cardiac surgery? Uh, the, the second question is. Uh, shall we give the uh, prophylactic antibiotic for a patient with a prosthetic valve for non cardiac uh, surgery? I mean, uh, uh, for how long earlier I should give him uh, the, the antibiotic? 24 hours before, 48 hours, something like that. Thank you. So, because there is a sound issue, what was the first question? Sorry? Uh, the first question if, have, if I have thrombolyzed the patient, uh, looks like with pulmonary embolism. He has received like TPA or streptokinase. Yeah. So for how long shall I wait before we take him to another operation uh, for non-cardiac uh, surgery? Thank Again, you. it depends on the uh, type of surgery. If it is an emergency surgery, okay, you have to go to surgery and you have to reverse the anticoagulation and you have to weigh the risks of and the benefits for this patient. If it is not, you should go with the guidelines, wait, and at least uh, for any patient who is anticoagulated, uh, uh, at least three months before reassessment, again, 
and trying to put him back to uh, surgery. Okay, so... Um, okay, and the second question is the antibiotic prophylaxis? Yes. Yes, yes. For, for what patient, sorry? Uh, if, if I have a patient with a prosthetic valve, uh, so for... Uh, is it a prosthetic, uh, you mean mechanical valve or, or a tissue valve, sorry? Uh, I mean, no, I mean mechanical valve. Uh, yeah. Mechanical valve, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, and the question? Uh, I mean, when, when we shall start the antibiotic earlier, I mean two, two days, one day, three days, or start at the same, same day of the operation. You start the same day of the operation, and you always, every, every hospital has its own protocol on the, on, the, on the type of the antibiotic and the duration for the continuation of the antibiotics. Uh, so, for example, in, 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 in our hospital, for example, it's, we use targoseed or tycoplanin, uh, uh, and this, this is usually according to the antibiogram which is done in the hospital and we use uh, the, the dose thing before uh, going to surgery and another dose after 12 hours and we take it from there according to the patient's conditions, according to CRP, according to the other uh, uh, inflammatory markers of the patient. Okay, thank, thank you, Dr. Am. So, Ahmed uh, Yusuf. Mohamed Abdel Maqsoud. Uh, regarding the risk stratification of a patient and uh, assessing him and taking the decision to go to uh, uh, testing or proceed to procedure, who takes the decision, uh, a cardiologist or anesthetist or both, or how it can be done or managed? So if you listen to the cardiologist, they say that we take the decision, okay? If you listen to the anesthesiologists, they say we take the decisions. But if you are willing to help the patient, this decision should be a collaborative decision. And uh, uh, some, some patients need an MDT, which is a multidisciplinary team decision making, including the anesthetist, the cardiologist, and the uh, cardiothoracic surgeon. Uh, uh, this is very important. Uh, and even in the guidelines, it says European Society of Cardiologists and European Society of Anesthetists. So it's, 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 a, it's a, a, a collaboration. Uh, so it's, it's not a competition. It's not a clinic. And it's not uh, uh, seeking money from it. But it's for the patient's sake. Uh, Sayed, Sayed, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amr, for the amazing lecture. And it's my honor to work under your supervision in Alex Mann University Hospital. Um, and now my question in, uh, is, my question is, as you mentioned before, the beta blocker should be titrated uh, during use. Uh, and uh, how, how, so how can we use the titration of the beta blockers in hypotensive anesthesia? It's, so it's beta blockers is the indication for the beta blockers, you know very much that the, this indication is this patients with heart failure, okay, or patients with very high risk surgeries and low functional capacities, okay? So high dose is totally condemned. No way for high dose, and this was all proof. Low dose, you should monitor the patient. So if you have a patient coming to you with a heart rate of 55 and, uh, uh, or 50, and he is like 40 years old or 50 years, this is not, a, a, a compatible heart rate with this age and with the comorbidities. So you have to modify the dose of the beta blockers before going to surgery, reduce it and reassess again. You should, you should never allow a patient with a, a, a borderline hemodynamics, especially in terms of heart rate and the blood pressure to go into surgery and, and then have hypotensive anesthesia again, which is <laughs> um, a, a very uh, high risk factor for causing insults to the brain, to the heart. So optimization of the dose is very important according to the hemodynamic picture of the patient. Uh, perfect. So uh, those who are raising hands here, uh, they cannot be unmuted for a reason or another. I don't know if... You... Okay, so Ahmed Kandil, go ahead, please. Uh, uh, in a patient... Uh who is bedridden or he is, uh, uh, who could not, I could not assess his exercise tolerance. Uh, how could I assess such patients uh, and certify his risk? 
you deal with this patient as if the patient has a low, low emits, less than four. Should I go then for, uh, for stress test, stress ECG or stress echo? We said, again, we said that the stress, stress tests are always class 2B, okay? They are not, uh, and if they are going, even with the American, if, you, if, if it is going to change your decision, do it. If it is not going to change your decision, don't do it. So assessment of the patient and then seeing the patient preoperatively. You saw him, you, you know, if this is according to the type of surgery and according to his condition that you see, is this testing going to change your decision? Taking him <coughs> to an, an aesthetic plan, is it gonna be changed? or not. If so, go with, deal with this patient as if he is patient with low functional capacity. Milad, go ahead. Minutes. Milad, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Walid. My question about, uh, we are talking about, about the biomarkers for congestive heart failure. We are talking about the BFB. What about the troponin in ischemic heart disease? So troponin. do you measure troponin in preoperative or postoperative? And what kind of troponin? Normal, ordinary troponin, or ultra-sensitive troponin? It's uh, it's the usual troponin that you use for the for the patients with the MI and for the acute coronary syndrome. But the issue here is: Are you using this troponin uh, preoperatively? No. It's, it's, if this patient is in acute coronary syndrome, you will do it anyway. If this patient is not in acute coronary syndrome, you don't have to do it. Okay. For the post-operative period or surveillance, you have to, you can do the troponin, okay? If this patient is already showing, showing picture of acute, of ST, ECG changes in the ST, uh, uh, ST changes in the ECG, or if he has a, a, a acute coronary syndrome, or if this patient is in a very high risk category of developing ischemia post-operatively. Okay, and this is not very well uh, uh, established. So only the established, if this patient is complaining or if this patient have uh, ECG uh, changes. And I think this was the last question. No, I know, I, uh, okay. I have one question to, to finish this uh, session. Uh, Dr. Amr, please, uh, you know, this, uh, the usual practice everywhere that any cardiac patient yeah, we have to consult cardiology. Call ca cardiologist. Call cardiologist. We, have, we need echo. So, when to consult cardiologist and what we want from the cardiologist to tell us? Whenever you suspect any issue with the LV function, which will sure affect your anesthetic management, you should have an echo. You should consult a cardiologist for that. Uh, 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 with the echo results. But if you don't have any issue with the LV function of this patient and you do not suspect that this patient have any uh, uh, issue with his LV function, just you don't have to consult cardiologists and you don't have even to do uh, an echo uh, yeah. for these patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Amr. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. We came to the to come to the end of our session today. Thank you very much, Professor Samil Ansari, for your very nice informative lecture. Thank you very much, my dear uh, brother, Dr. Amr. Very, very good uh, lecture also. Thank you very much. Thank you for the, all the attendees. Hope to see you next time. And thank you for all of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.